So for the next for the next hour, we're going to discuss one of the choices of communication channels for the potential dissemination of intentionally harmful information is, of course, journalism. And in this session, we're going to discuss current issues with and potential interventions around journalistic integrity. It's my honor to introduce the facilitator for this discussion, Taylor Owen, mm -hmm. who is the Beaverbrook Chair in Media Ethics and Communication and the founding director of the Center for Media Technology and Democracy and associate professor in the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, Alan. Um, thank you. So we're going to talk about journalism for the next hour. Um, I think it's fortuitous we've had, we've just had the conversation we had. Because I think in many ways, these two issues of the business of disinformation and the financial model in which we share and disseminate information and this current state of journalism are fundamentally intertwined. And in many ways, that's because we've moved our signals of reliability, our financial model for journalism, our audience engagement, our distribution, all into the same spaces, into these same digital platforms in which disinformation is also spread. And so these two issues are connected. And I think the challenges facing journalism, which we're going to get into, are real um, at the moment. So at the same time as we've seen this real rise, as we've heard over the last day, of the problem of unreliable information, we've seen real struggles in the industry that has for 100 years been our provider of reliable information. So these two issues are fundamentally connected. Um, and we have a pretty amazing group to discuss that tension and those interconnections with um, today. Um, Raju is currently at McKinsey leading their global publishing efforts, um, but has literally been at the center of newsroom innovations and thinking about the business of news um, for his career. Um, Vina works for one of the primary companies in the world providing signals of reliability for news organizations, trying to help us as citizens and users of the internet and of news, of news products decide what is reliable and what isn't. And Richard has spent his career thinking about journalism and its role in society. So I want to start um, with just where we are as a news industry broadly. I think in most countries, there's an acknowledgement that the businesses of journalism are struggling. Um, news organizations are closing, journalists are being let go. Um, but I, I think we should do a bit of a landscape picture of just where that is at the moment. So, Raju, can you maybe start? Where, how, where is the business of journalism at the moment? How would you describe the sector as a whole? Thanks, Taylor. Um... Before I do that, I do want to acknowledge um, Alan. He's put together a brilliantly eclectic group here Absolutely. in this room, on stage and in the audience, and there are probably people online as well. Thank you, Alan, for doing that. <laughs> Though I did see him yesterday, and I was like, he's clearly misinforming us because he said business casual, and he was in a full suit and tie. <laughs> 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 um, I'm also, I've noticed that I'm also one of those speakers who's actually not going to talk about his day job because I don't, even though I publish a lot, mm. I, it's not journalism or news. Uh, McKinsey publishes a bunch of business to business content. So this is really based on my experience at the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. And so I'm speaking for myself rather than for um, McKinsey. Um, I'm probably going to be a little bit of a contrarian even on this panel because um, when it comes to um, the state of journalism and mm. the business of journalism, mm. um, I think when you go to a journalism conference, there's a lot of gloom and doom. There's no other industry that talks about its own demise more than journalists do. <laughs> um, you don't hear you know, people on TV saying TV is dying, but you read a lot in newspapers that newspapers are dying. Hasn't happened yet. They're probably in hospice but mm -hmm. not dead yet. Um, so I am, That's your point of optimism, is hospice as opposed uh, to full. Yeah. I'm of the opinion that the glass is neither half full nor half empty, but the glass is actually refillable. And the reason I say that is, um, as of last month, uh, 
Um, 65 percent of the world's population, which is about 5.2 billion people, are on the internet on a regular basis. What that means is there are another 2.9 billion people who are likely to come onto the internet in a relatively short time, because we went from 50 percent to 65 percent in the last five years. So if I were to tell you that there's an industry whose products are in demand, and there's probably a three billion new customer segment that's going to come and consume their products, you would all say that must be a pretty amazing industry to be in, right? Which is what the news industry is. While we sit here and focus on Facebook and Twitter and Snap and everybody else, the reality is that none of those platforms actually create news, right? They, they're amazing for virality and dissemination. Um, they still depend on the news industry to kind of create um, the content. And if you look at the history of the news business, um, we have never had more and larger and bigger audiences than we have now, and we will never have, uh, we'll continue to have more and more. I was at the Wall Street Journal for like some 20 years. At the peak of the Wall Street Journal's newspaper business, if we added up every single copy in Europe, Asia, and the US, we would get to 2.3 million subscribers. So let's assume that they're all reading it. They're not, but let's assume that, right? Today, the same Wall Street Journal newsroom, which is about 1,800 people, I think, give or take, reaches about 50 million readers online. They still have about 700,000 print subscribers. They have about 3 million paying digital subscribers. So the Wall Street Journal as a brand has never had a larger audience than it is today, and it's probably going to get even bigger. Even BuzzFeed News, which kind of went out of business, has actually continued to grow its audience. So our problem in our industry is not that there is no demand for our product. The issue has been around um, the business model, right? How do you monetize? People really want it. And that remains an open question, but even there, I see a lot of reasons to be optimistic if news organizations know how to go around. And the reasons are, I'll give four or five reasons. One is, I think, the old ways of saying nobody is going to pay for news have dramatically changed in the last decade because we are all paying for everything, right? Streaming, I think, really fundamentally changed our attitude towards paying for content. Sure, I mean, Netflix is not the same thing as paying for The Guardian, but the idea of selling something online and getting people to pay has become a lot easier, actually, if you have a good product. Two, while the business models continue to struggle between advertising and subscription, I think Veena is going to talk a little bit about that as well, um, there's been, a, in the last five, 10 years, there's been a big emergence of philanthropy supporting news, which was never the case 10, 15 years ago. In fact, most rich people stayed away from the news business. But now you see individuals, obviously, the Bezos of the world, but a lot of philanthropic organizations are supporting news, particularly in the US. Um, so that's a pretty good sign. I think the diversification of the news business, you know, the New York Times is a great example of creating a lot of products surrounding their news with that and actually being very successful with it, mm -hmm. like cooking and you know, shopping and all of that. And if the New York Times can do this, I think a lot of others can actually think about doing it. Um, there is more money coming in, whether we like it or not. Um, in addition to buying footballers, the Saudis are actually willing to fund a lot of journalism around the world. It depends on what kind of journalism is willing to be funded by the Saudis. But my point is that there is actually money that's looking for investment. <laughs> We're going to disagree, which is the point of this, right? Um, I go back to this idea of, like, we've been talking about the end of newspapers. Hasn't happened yet. May not happen in our lifetimes. Um, so that's still a good thing. The other thing, and I think Taylor is going to talk more about this as well, the government in the last few years has emerged as a possible uh, catalyst for a new source of funding through kind of regulation. So all of this adds up to a pretty optimistic view of the ability for the news industry to survive. Whether individual brands can take advantage of it, can do it, I think is a different issue. And it varies by country. Um, again, I think, Taylor, you're going to talk a little bit about Canada, and I think my colleagues here are going to talk about the UK. I can say a little bit about India. Um, 
one of the few markets where the language, the non-English print business is still growing. Right? It's just very unusual, but it's still a mm -hmm. kind of a growth story. Mm -hmm. So all of this gives me optimism mm -hmm. that uh, we could have a relatively benign future, if not bright. So I'll stop there. Richard, I see you vigorously shaking your head. So why don't you yeah, I'm, go next on this, the state of the business? Of, uh, are uh, Saudis right, the future of journalism? I love your optimism, Raju, but I do feel I need to just inject a little bit of skepticism. So um, <laughs> I don't want journalism funded by state actors, be they Saudi or any other state actors, because I want independence. Um, I don't want journalism to rest on philanthropy. Philanthropy uh, is doing great things in the US. It's less so in other parts of the world, certainly in Europe, and I speak as a co-chair of a non-profit uh, news organization which um, struggles to find sufficient funding. Um, so I, I, I don't share your optimism there. Um, uh, I think we are seeing a real shift in approaches to business models. You know, BuzzFeed's gone out, news has gone out of business, Vice has gone out of business. These were the future of journalism just a few years ago but they were uh, building an audience, they were focused on reach, uh, and they were unable to sufficiently monetize that reach. And focused on advertising. And focused on advertising, and advertising is, has, yeah. has, has sunk. Uh, so we've moved from a focus on reach to a focus on revenue. Uh, subscription is working. Uh, membership models are working. The Guardian yesterday posted record profits, uh, including a record contribution from its membership scheme. Um, and advertising uh, continues to plummet. The New York Times is the case study for success in moving into digital with digital products uh, and digital re uh, advertising revenues substituting for the decline in traditional advertising. So there are big brands, you know, the focus has now gone from startups who are gonna show the world how it should be done to the big brands reasserting themselves based upon subscription uh, and membership models and so on as well. So what do you take from that in terms of purely what works in for business uh, subscription and membership is, is working, bundling works. I suspect Wordle and The Athletic are as important to the New York Times as their foreign affairs analysis. Um, uh, and uh, scale is increasingly important. But the truth underneath all of that is there isn't one model. And I think it's pretty clear that the future of uh, uh, news business and the journalism business is gonna be multiple models and it's still very volatile and it's changing all the time, and, it, and we're about to see AI have an impact on the news business. That's gonna change the whole cost base and so on as well. Uh, we're seeing the technology continue to change. I was talking to somebody yesterday who pointed out that actually web pages, as we understand them now, have probably got a very limited lifespan because it's all gonna be individually adapted and individually formatted by algorithms, and everybody's experience uh, of, of a web page is gonna be completely different. So how does the news industry respond to that? How do other industries respond to that? It's a very open question. Mm. How do they monetize out of that? It's a very open question. It's gonna go on being very volatile. But where we are now is, if you've got scale, and if you bundle, and you've got a brand, and you've got a reputation, then actually those organizations are doing better. The startup world where let's just build a reach and sell, uh, seems to, that phase seems to have passed. I mean, it's worth noting the number of institutions that share those three criteria are fairly limited. I mean, that is a a small, small group of global organizations. But Vina, you guys work with news businesses around the world. How do you, do you see optimism there? And what models do you see working and not? So we've had optimism, skepticism, and- Richard is actually- Realism, <laughs> bring on realism. <laughs> and I think I'm, I'll just chime in with transparency, which is where I think we can all make our own decisions about how we feel about certain parts of the business model mm -hmm. of journalism. You know whether you think subscription revenue is successful or not, or the role of advertising, mm -hmm. ultimately most outlets thrive on a combination of the two. And we are essentially in the business of championing quality news publishers in the ad industry, you know, being the conduit for brands and advertisers to continue investing in quality journalism that aligns with their own values and redirecting their ad spend away from purveyors of misinformation, um, which is, at a huge opportunity cost to the quality newsrooms that produce expensive, high-quality journalism. You know, adhering to transparent editorial standards in the way that NewsGuard assesses them, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, because this is an audience of financial accounting and lots of reporting professionals where, if you like, the credit rating agency for, for the news media industry whereby we evaluate uh, editorial standards on apolitical criteria of 
transparency and credibility. You know, it's not just good sense to do that and the ethical right thing to do with journalism, it's also good business because that creates a, a signpost for the industry and for your advertisers, your donors, your B2B subscribers in building the credibility of your brand as endorsed by, by a third party. So I think maybe I'm getting ahead of your, your second question mm. about trust, but so much of this is about surfacing the right information and context for us to be making those decisions on our own terms. Well, let's get into trust a minute here. I mean, leaving aside the huge caveat that trust is a tricky, I think, concept with journalism. I mean, almost 100% of Fox News users, viewers trust Fox News, and the opposite is true for MSNBC, right? I mean, tr so trust is a very personal thing in journalism. But Richard, it's also certainly true that trust in the institutions of media and journalism has shifted. Um, how do you see the arc of that at the moment, and is that worrying? Uh, it does worry me, but I think it's I, I think it's slightly misconceived sometimes. So, I mean, certainly there are bad actors who are actively seeding mistrust, and I think it was mentioned yesterday, yeah. RT, Russia Today's marketing slogan once was question more, which means yeah. trust less. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, there are active, and, and, you know, the fake news cries from, from uh, Donald Trump and so on as well. Mm -hmm. So there are active attempts to undermine trust. But, you know, also the, the decline of trust in media as an institution goes alongside with a decline in trust in all sorts of other institutions. Mm. Um, and I also think there are positive things about it. If you want the public to be skeptical about bad information, you can't be surprised if they also apply that skepticism to um, traditional purveyors of information and news and yeah. journalism as well. Uh, so I think skepticism can be a healthy thing. Mm. Uh, I don't think the media has helped itself. We're here in the UK after the phone hacking scandal. Uh, we're in the home of the British tabloids. Nobody should be surprised if there's declining trust and a lot of skepticism about uh, journalism uh, uh, from those kinds of uh, sources and so as well in, in this country. Um, but then we get into the kind of digital arguments and you know, some of the, the problem is, as, as, as was also been said earlier, you know, on, on social platforms, you know, high quality news or, or news from trusted purveyors looks very much the same as junk. I mean, if you're looking at it on, you know, the landscape of a phone screen, it's very different, difficult to kind of point up the public interest value on that, that amount of territory uh, as against something else that's being put out there. So differentiating yourself and differentiating quality and differentiating your values mm. is harder and harder in a digital uh, environment. Mm. So there is general skepticism. Um, the Reuters Institute at Oxford that I, I also do, have done some work with has done quite a lot of research on trust in news, mm. and they find that those who distrust it most tend to be older, less news engaged, uh, coming from underrepresented communities, and I think one of the biggest challenges is not so much mistrust as indifference and news avoidance yeah. that we're now seeing. Yeah. And I think finally, the other thing in, in the Reuters study was very interesting. They did a, a focus group talking to groups of journalists and then groups of consumers about the question of trust in news. And the journalists talked about things like the role of the tech platforms, competition for attention, polarization, um, clickbait, uh, emotional impact, bad actors. Mm. Uh, the, the users, the public, talked about familiarity and reputation, concerns about bias and accuracy, uh, concerns about commercial agendas, lack of relevance to their lifestyles. Mm. and presentation styles and appearance and did it relate to them and, and what did they feel about it. Mm. Very different kinds of concerns about it. So there's a gap there in the digital environment between how as an industry we're worried about it and what we think matters and what the audience is actually yeah. um, concerned about. So I think the whole question of trust is a very complicated one uh, uh, and you know, trust in institutions generally is in decline mm. but I think the news industry also needs to look hard at itself uh, uh, for the reasons, and rather than just try and blame other people for it. Yeah. Vina, your NewsGuard is at the center of this conversation about trust, and that you've broken down what you think is our signals of reliability and trust in the production process of news and journalism. Can you break down some of those elements? So when you, when you look at an organization, how do you decide whether it should be trusted? Yeah, that's a good question. So. NewsGuard rates the credibility of news sources on nine apolitical criteria um, on a weighted basis. That criteria includes things like, does the website repeatedly publish false content, which is 
weighted very heavily at 22 points out of 100, all the way down to things like does it name its content creators, is it forthcoming about its sources of funding, um, does it clearly label its advertising, and so forth. Um, so to me, rebuilding trust is really about fostering transparency between internet users, consumers of media, brands, and democracies, um, you know, which is why our approach is writing these nutrition labels, um, which kind of describe and rationalize the work of our human analysts um, and surface this information about, listen, we're not here to tell you, don't read this or, you know, definitely click on that. It's about, here's what you're getting yourself into from a purely editorial standards perspective. And with that context, you decide, is this something I want to click on or share with family and friends? Mm. Um, and it's also about preserving media plurality. Um, and there have been various conversations yesterday um, about kind of the partisan nature of, of misinformation. But I think taking a non-partisan approach to this and recognizing that there are publications across the political spectrum that can be transparent in their funding, their interests, their perspectives, and indeed they are, um, that still gives us the information that we need to make better decisions about what we want to trust. Mm -hmm. Something I'm really heartened by is the fact that when, we, when our analysts seek comment from the publishers that we rate, which yeah. we do for, for every, every publisher, um, more than 2,100 of them, so roughly 20% of our, our data set, um, have actually improved their standards as a result of engaging with us. Mm. Um, you know, this is about creating more transparency for the whole industry. Our criteria is available for anyone to see, and we encourage publishers to game our system, if you like, because mm. when they get higher scores, that just produces a, a higher quality news environment for everyone. You mentioned partisanship. Do you see a correlation in any way between partisanship and your rankings? There's always going to be members of the public and institutions who believe we are, you know, too much in favor of one side or another. And I, there are so many examples of what that looks like. Um, but in truth, it's something that we have seen across the political spectrum. Um, our reporting has covered everything from pink slime news sites or kind of posing as local news sites in the US, um, which are very influential in election periods, um, this type of interference. Um, as well as far-right misinformation. I mean, it really, it really spans the whole spectrum. And I think, um, you know, we've seen, likewise, excellent examples of transparent, high-quality reporting from organizations that are viewed to be on one side of Absolutely. the spectrum or another. Yeah. Ajay, do you want to jump in on the broader question of trust? Just picking up on what Richard said, I think most journalism organizations think of this as an outside problem. It's a problem with their readers mm. and that somehow they are yeah. kind of impacted by it. Yeah. But I think this looking in the mirror thing is a very critical one. Our practices have led to this, right? I'll mm -hmm. give you a couple of concrete examples. One is, I think, in the, in the 80s and 90s when business was starting to slow, mm -hmm. the first thing most news organizations did was they ended their classroom liter media literacy programs. Mm -hmm. They used to do classroom editions. They used to fund a lot of this. Mm -hmm. They completely stopped them mm -hmm. because they thought that was like, you know, mm -hmm. there was no ROI in that sense. Mm -hmm. And two or three generations of kids have now grown up without understanding the value of mainstream media and mm. sourcing and all of that. And I think we're going to see the consequences of that for quite a bit. Mm. The second one is I think our industry, uh, newspapers are called the daily miracle because it is a miracle that you put that thing out every 24 hours, right? But that has also meant that we've been very, very opaque of how we make decisions and how things happen. Mm. And as a result of that, I think we have not been, to Vina's point as well, been transparent about how we do what we do. Mm. As a result, I don't think a lot of people appreciate and understand what it takes to be a qualified journalist. And most people think that anybody with a phone and a user-generated content is kind of equivalent to journalism, which it is not. And then one final point, which is happening even now, we write a lot about like, tech companies and you know, how they use ad trackers and this and that. But the newspaper industry is one of the biggest kind of problem industry when it comes to that. There's a nonprofit called The Markup uh, in the US, which kind of looks at tech. Um, they have a tool called The Backlight. It's the markup.org. You can, you can go put in any URL, and it'll tell you what kind of trackers that, um, that website is using. I did it this morning just for this session. Mm -hmm. um, 
ad trackers, third-party mm -hmm. cookies? Is it allowing Google to track you wherever you go once you come to their site? Mm -hmm. um, the Wall Street Journal, 50 ad trackers and 71 third-party cookies. The New York Times, um, 20 ad trackers and 20 third-party cookies. Right? BBC, 10 ad trackers, 14. So if you go there today, that's what is happening to you and your data. Right? So, and nowhere on their websites, on our websites, like BBC, anywhere, they actually talk about this. Right? Mm. So I think this is the kind of behavior mm. that actually fosters a reduction in trust, and I don't see the industry kind of recognizing that and mm. wanting to be more transparent. Let alone, leaving us, let alone the, what our colleague and friend Emily Bell calls the links of shame at the bottom of news articles, those like crazy <laughs> fake news links yeah. that sit below journalism on news sites. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, I think just, just to pick up on, on, on that briefly, you know, a, a lot of news organizations have basically ceded a lot of their distribution to the tech platforms. And uh, for in, in an insufficient return in terms of the share of advertising and all the rest of it. Mm. And we know from you know, uh, uh, pub public opinion research that people have distinctly less trust in mm. online news than they do in broadcasting in particular, but even in, in, in direct sites. Um, uh, so, you know, in a sense, they're seeding their reputation as well to organizations which don't actually care about them. And we've seen from the, you know, the clashes we're starting to see in, you know, you mentioned the, the Canada deal where um, Meta is turning off news feeds in, in their platforms in Canada. The same thing happened in Australia. We're seeing the uh, disputes between um, news publishers and the platforms over the use of um, publisher content to train AI. You know, more and more we're seeing actually the, the, the interests of these two sectors don't align. Yeah. And yet, news organizations did cede so much of their business and their distribution, and therefore, in brackets, their reputation, to organizations that don't care about them, basically. Yeah. So one challenge is just the provision of sufficient, reliable information by, jur by journalistic organizations to compete against the sea of potentially false information. But there are also cases, and Vina, you referred to these, where journalism itself is weaponized. And journalism itself becomes, or the perception of journalism, becomes a vector for disinformation, such as pink slime websites or fake news websites. Can you talk a little about that problem and, and what you do to address it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll talk about two things here. First, the kind of state-sponsored media angle of things mm. and then the impact of, of AI. Yeah. Um, RT, the state broadcaster in Russia, recently actually cited a chat GPT generated response that placed the 2014 Maidan uprising in Ukraine on the list of coups that Washington has been involved in, <laughs> effectively treating a chatbot output um, as an authoritative source. And that is something that is only going to continue, and that is a kind of way that we're seeing the information ecosystem being weaponized mm. and taken advantage of by bad actors, mm. turbocharged by the power of, of generative AI. And mm. to that end, we've identified a rapidly growing subsection of what we call made for advertising websites, which are essentially websites with minimal or kind of low quality content designed to garner ad clicks and collect ad revenue. Um, which is already a problem because these are competing with the quality news sites that actually need that revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but now those are multiplying and can be set up in a matter of minutes using mm -hmm. predominantly AI-generated content. Um, so we've identified you know, hundreds of these with likely many more to come. Um, and the problem with these, again, is it's just decreasing the, the level of trust in the news ecosystem. You've got mm -hmm. um, chatbot produced content, mm -hmm. very little to no human oversight, and the ability to create brand new misinformation sites about whatever topic your heart desires, collecting that ad revenue. Instantly um, at scale. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't even understand yet the, the magnitude of what this problem can cause both society and kind of the harm for the journalism industry. Mm -hmm. Actually, can you pick up on that? Because you mentioned earlier that um, we needed journalistic organizations to produce content to be distributed on platforms. How does generative AI and where we're going to go there change that proposition? These three billion users that are going to come online, do they need journalists to produce journalistic content? 
I mean, the answer is yes, right? I mean, Gen AI or all of, all of the models there do need something to kind of then synthesize and produce it, right? They don't actually create mm -hmm. original content. I think where we are headed, and Emma mentioned that in her session about uh, Cambridge Analytica and the mm -hmm. kind of the neurotic um, targeting. Mm -hmm. I think we are in a world where we worry a lot about um, the one to many, like a site that's yeah. created to then reach a lot of people. Yeah. But with Gen AI, I think where we are headed is the ability for a bad actor to say, um, let me scrape what Richard or Veena or Raju have said in public, their Twitter, all of that, right? Feed it back to the Gen AI and say, create a disinformation campaign for Raju, yeah. right? What would like actually make him kind of knowing what he has said before? Yeah. And the scale at which we can do that, um, you could create a million of those profiles. Mm. Then you suddenly have one-to-one -one misinformation. Mm. That's going to be a lot harder to kind of really go after. Yes. You can go after the pink side slides, right? Because you know who they are. Yeah. But as the moment it becomes one-to-one. -one. So I think that's the challenge we need to think about how do we get there in terms of either regulation or yeah. other ways. Yeah. The second piece I do want to touch on is that I think we look at bad actors as kind of outside the mainstream media industry. Mm. I also increasingly worry about, in a lot of countries, Hungary, Turkey, India, lots of places, the mainstream media is being acquired by government. Mm. And this creates an interesting conundrum. I'm in my non-day job, I'm on the board of Wikimedia, which runs the global Wikipedia, which is, as you know, is based on citations. And up until now, we were like, citations of mainstream media is actually good quality citation. But if an entire country's media is co-opted by the government, all the citations are only a point of view, yeah. right? So how do you deal with that kind of scale mm. of disinformation mm. when the biggest news organizations, TV stations, are all owned by either the government directly yeah. or friends of the government? Mm. And what they're putting out is actually just a one point of view. Yeah. I think those are the big challenges that lie ahead. Yeah. Richard? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, of course, just bad actors or AI. If you look at the, the scale of greenwashing that we're seeing at the minute, um, yeah. so there's misinformation from corporates. We know about misinformation from leading politicians and so on as well. All of this weaponizes information in one, in one way uh, uh, or another. Um, so, you know, it, it's, we shouldn't just think it's the bad guys or, mm. or awkward tech that's doing this. It's part of the general environment we're living in and um, all sorts of reputable, supposedly reputable individuals and brands are involved in it as well. Um, I do think there's opportunity here, though, for journalism and for media, that particularly for public media, to uh, take a larger role in verification, mm. uh, in fact-checking, in pre-bunking and challenging, um, uh, in open source um, uh, investigation, interrogation, and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the bureau that I'm involved in has just launched um, a project ahead of all of the upcoming elections to identify the networks of influence, where the money's coming from, you know, who, who may be trying to seed misinformation into these election campaigns and all the rest of it. There's opportunity there, and of course, you know, if you do that, then you will win trust and you will, you know, hopefully reinforce your, your audience and, and all other aspects of your business. So I do think the media needs to reorientate itself to uh, understand the environment that it's in and respond to the opportunities that lie in this as well. Yeah. Um, anybody has questions, please get ready. I'm going to come to everybody in a second. I just want to, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk for a moment about the role of government in this conversation. and. Um, I mean, I think in most sectors, if you have a product or a service that is seen as being important for society that the market isn't sufficiently providing, that's when you expect governments to step in, um, when there's a market failure on something that we think is important to democratic society. But with journalism, it's tricky because journalists hold governments to account. And their role in society is, to hold, is in part to hold governments to account. And yet, in spite of this, in, in response to this failure, we're now seeing governments step in. Um, in Canada, as you mentioned, we've done a version of the Australian News B Media Bargaining Code. We have a 25% labor tax credit for journalistic labor. We give subscription tax credits, a whole suite of things. And these are now being replicated and, and implemented in democratic countries around the world and a liberal-leaning countries around the world. 
Um, I wonder how you all reflect on that. Like, is government part of the solution here? And, and what do you think governments can be doing cautiously and responsibly in response to this potential market failure? Anybody? Richard, you want to? Uh, well, well, let me kick off. I mean, I, you know, I think for both regulation and subsidy, there, there is a role, but I am cautious about how big a role that they yeah. should have. So, you know, you want effective regulation that is, um, you know, the least that's required to be effective, as it were. Mm. Um, I don't want over-regulation, but I think certainly in terms of market dominance for the big tech companies, there is a, an overwhelming case now for uh, regulation, how that's structured. We heard a little bit about it yesterday from... Mm. Um, uh, from Europe and from Ofcom in the UK and so on as well, and that's still uh, emerging. But I think the, the dominance of the tech companies and the impact that they're having on the market uh, is clearly a case for some form of, uh, of regulation in, yeah. in many, if not um, all, territories. Subsidy, I think, is a little bit more difficult. In, in the UK, we had um, a government-sponsored uh, review, the Cane Cross Review, particularly looking at the kind of collapse of local news, uh, which concluded that there should be a kind of public fund, um, contestable funding that um, uh, news organisations and so on can call on. I, I think that's fine as a bridge, but I personally don't think that public subsidy is a sustainable future for news or for journalism. But we are, we do need some kind of support and some kind of bridge, particularly for local journalism, you know, while we're going through such a volatile um, uh, period at the moment. Yeah. But I don't actually think it's sustainable in the long term. On the other hand, in this, in this country, you've seen a collapse in reporting of courts and councils and so on in, in local uh, uh, areas. And there was a, um, a democracy reporters scheme, which actually took some of the BBC license fee, funded what they called democracy reporters, which sat in local newspaper offices and with the, with the specific aim of, of increasing the reporting of um, you know, public issues, public affairs in courts and councils and so on. And that seems to have been effective. But I, I, I am cautious about saying that's a way forward. Let's just grab bit, you know, lumps of public money from wherever we can find them and throw them at the problem. I don't think in the end that's sustainable. Okay. Raj, do you want to jump in with that? Yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to debate the role of the government in forcing tech companies to pay mm. media companies like in Australia, yeah. or like in Canada, because I think the, there was a market failure and mm. I think the, the value exchange was kind of skewed in favor of the tech companies. Mm. Where I do have an um, issue is that, and I'm going to exaggerate a little bit to make my point, this is like the government suing the shipping companies for reparations for slavery and saying, but the money should go to the plantation owners. Right? The, the reason I make this point is we are not asking media companies, what are you going to do with the money that we are making sure mm. big tech companies are paying you? If they're going to go to an organization that has systematically destroyed local journalism mm. by consolidation, right? Mm. And they're at the corporate level, they're going to get paid by mm. Google or Meta mm. or what is the inherent social value of that, right? Mm. So I would rather we also focus when these deals happen mm. to say, how, where is the money going? What is it actually going to do? Mm. We are talking, all of us, I think there's somebody in the room with a title, right? Director of um, uh, Responsible AI mm. kind of title. We are talking about that when it comes to Gen AI, right? But I don't see the journalism industry having any titles of director for responsible journalism, right? Nor do I see Google, for example, has hired uh, an ex-McKinsey colleague of mine to lead their ethics because they want to apply that to Gen AI, right? Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, Meta and um, Twitter and all have had oversight boards. I don't see the journalism industry really kind of wanting to do that to themselves. Mm -hmm the ombudsmen and the public editors are mostly gone. Yeah. And when they were there, they used to write about things after the fact. Mm. So would it make sense when in Canada, mm. for the, if the government is making sure that the big tech companies are going to fund journalism, to also talk about how are you going to use the money? Yeah. So I think there may be ways to kind of actually make it really be useful yeah. and then give it to big private equity newspaper chains that are actually removing local journalism. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because one of the biggest chains in Canada that's going to receive these funds is owned by a U.S. Um, hedge fund for its debt, right? So, I mean, so th there is a challenge there. But one thing I would point out, though, is that um, the more government specifies how it should be used, the more it get critiques, gets critiqued for intervening in the independence of journalism. 
So there's a balance there, right, between leaving it to journalistic organizations to decide how to use these funds and telling them what to do with them. Um, and it, there's, there's a balance there. But Rita, do you, Rita, do you want to jump in here on the policy side? I know you, you guys stay away from policy mostly, but... Yeah, I just think we need tools to support the rollout of policy. We've had so many discussions about what good policy looks like and maybe too little on the implementation of that because my big concern is the fact that journalism and news media is lumped into one category in the eyes of, eyes of the law and the eyes of policy, but actually, you know, not all news outlets are made equal. Mm -hmm. um, and when we have clear information about what that actually looks like and what standards we're talking about and which reputable organizations adhere to their responsible um, duty of journalism, we can make more informed decisions about mm -hmm. how we treat them. And I think I'll just mention something when it comes to brands and the private sector's role in this. It's 2023 and you would be surprised at the number of advertisers um, who have a news budget and continue to use archaic keyword block lists, including words like black and gay. And this is something that does not get updated. Mm. And so what that does, and you mentioned local news and the local news deserts, which is disproportionately of concern in, in this industry, what those keyword block lists do is harm the publications that serve minority communities, mm. arguably the ones that need mm. responsible, transparent, mm. high quality information the most. So it's also about the companies with deep pockets and large ad budgets to take a really close look at their role and what they can be doing to ensure that they are funding proper journalism and not contributing to, to this issue. Yeah, I wonder if we'll see a move away from some of the ad tech markets we heard about, programmatic advertising, towards more trusted networks um, because of that. Okay, um, questions. I saw a few hands originally, but um, okay. Well, I actually, someone else should choose because I can't see very well. Can someone with the microphone? Um, choose the hands. Is this on? No. The, uh, I wanted to ask real quickly about uh, one subject that has not, it's a great panel, but one subject that has not uh, come up, uh, just a way of setting up the question. I worked for about uh, 15 years as a radio correspondent in both Moscow and about 10 years at uh, the White House where I continue to be uh, based. Uh, radio, actually, I can't speak for other countries, but in the United States, radio penetrates more households than even the internet. It's particularly important in a lower, I think Averna addressed this with regard to print, uh, it's more important for, say, lower rungs of the economic ladder than, uh, than anything else. And the news deserts in radio have been, uh, they're enormous. Local newsrooms have been completely wiped out. Uh, the news deserts create opportunities for demagoguery and all of that. Uh, tell me about, uh, in terms of uh, journalistic integrity, the disappearance from a radio standpoint, if you have expertise in that area, uh, in, uh, in the United States, since that's the only market I can really be familiar with. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I don't know the, the U.S. market um, uh, that well. The, the one thing I would say is that I think, um, you know, the cutting of resources in radio, uh, I, I suspect this is true in the U.S., I think it's certainly true to a degree in various ways in, in the U.K. and Europe, uh, means you're getting less reporting and more opinion. So talk radio is uh, profitable. It's also cheap. It's, it's a lot cheaper to have someone sitting behind a microphone you know, opining or taking a phone, phone in than it is to send someone out on the ground to do evidence-based first-hand reporting. So what we've seen, certainly in the US, and of course it was then um, compounded by, you know, 40 years ago, the lifting of the Fairness Doctrine and all the rest of it, uh, is a huge mushrooming in opinion and talk radio. Uh, a lot of it, of course, funded from uh, the right, um, though, you know, um, you know, there are other factors there as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and we therefore have a kind of journalistic climate which values opinion above reporting and evidence. And I think that has undermined a lot of the kind of traditional values of journalism and I think undermined a lot of trust in media and journalism and so on as well. We're starting to import that into the UK a little bit in terms of both talk radio and the first really opinion-led news channels. Um, and, you know, there's quite a big challenge, I think, for Ofcom, which it hasn't quite stepped up to yet in working out how it confronts that in the UK market, um, uh, uh, 
frankly, in my view, to avoid what's happening, happened in the US, happening here. So we've started to rate um, broadcast channels as well as certain news networks and, and programs. And one of our main criteria is, does the site or the news source disclose the difference between news and opinion? We've had to reshape what that criteria looks like when it's applied to print media because it's so different um, in, a, in a radio context. I don't have it in front of me, but it includes things like, does the host adequately challenge the perspective um, if misinformation is raised, either by a fellow host or a guest? Um, as Richard said, you're in a more closed dialogue context, more informal, real time. There's not time to do fact checking or go out and corroborate information. Um, but it's one of the challenges of, of the medium. From an academic and civil society standpoint, monitoring mis and disinformation, audio is just vastly understudied because of the difficulty in collecting and analyzing it. Um, so uh, there's no question that talk radio is a significant vector of disinformation and misinformation, um, but we don't see it in the same way as we see social media content. Uh, microphones? Do you Hi. Want to yeah, sorry. Hi, Bonnie Rushing, U.S. Air Force Academy. Yes, it's me again. Um, I wanted to unpack something that uh, Mr. Richard said about uh, presentation style. So I'm working on how disinformation affects the U.S. military. And interestingly enough, in my recent data, one of the trends that came out was that cadets were concerned about production value along with sources, credibility, things of that nature. I was wondering if you could please describe different types of presentation styles that lead to trust. Thank you. So um, I think one of the things there is about transparency. So um, uh, are people open about how they've arrived at judgments? One of the things I think we've seen increasingly, particularly in, in broadcast, uh, and I'll, I'll come to digital and online in, in, in a moment, is, a, uh, and it picks up off the last question as well, uh, you know, with the rise of opinion, uh, news broadcasters have been keener to arrive at judgments about what's happening and judgments about the future, and they sometimes tend to overreach. And I think one of the big challenges, therefore, is to, if you like, open the box and explain how they've reached those judgments, what's contributed to those judgments. It's like the apocryphal maths teacher, you know, show your workings. Um, and that, I think, is becoming more of an issue uh, uh, for broadcast and is a plus. The caveat I'd put on that is uh, there's not a lot of evidence that the audience care. There have been a lot of experiments with greater transparency and radical transparency about methods because theoretically that ought to help. In practice, quite a lot of the audience feedback is, that's your business, just tell me what I need to know. Um, so that's quite complicated. Online, it's more, much, well, you can, you can be more transparent, but in a social social environment, then you know, you've got you know, 280 characters on social media or whatever, it's far harder to show what lies behind a judgment or a statement um, uh, uh, that's going to you know, perhaps reassure people about the, the value or the credibility of how you've arrived at that judgment. So uh, I think that's quite a big issue for not just news and journalists, but everyone is putting information, public information, it applies to governments, it applies to corporates and so on as well, is in the general climate of distrust, how can you reassure people about hidden agendas? There's a lot of um, uh, uh, suspicion about bias and hidden agendas and uh, uh, transparency to the extent that you can, can put it forward is about the only way of trying to, to, to address that. But in terms of the formats, particularly on social media and so on, it's, or, or even in a piece to camera on the TV news that's 20 seconds long, it's quite hard to do that. Just a couple of points. One is, I think, the lack of diversity in newsrooms, particularly in television, where you can see who the, what the newsroom is. I think that has an impact on whether you believe them or not, because if you're in a market that is very diverse and you, the newsroom doesn't reflect that, I think the production issue kicks in in that sense. Two, um, I think in television, this is also being exploited quite a bit. Um, a lot of uh, PR companies now offer to give a local station a minute and a half a fully produced segment that they can just put, and it's often it's paid for by a healthcare company pushing a particular product, but no disclosures, right? Because there's like a scarcity of good production quality of video, and they're willing to give that. So that's a real 
problem. The third thing, and this is a good thing as well, one of the ways to think about production is language diversity, right? Meaning whether you can, you know, Spanish or other languages. I think technology has made that a lot easier in some ways to translate things and put a lot of audio. That's helping. Mm. So both good and bad are happening. Hi, yes. Alexandra Pavluk from the Government of Canada's Foreign Office. Thank you. Uh, it struck a nerve the comment that Russia today was kind of publishing the uh, summary of U.S. coups saying that Maidan was one of them and saying that that came from ChatGPT. It, the risk with that is that young people are using ChatGPT more and even the search function TikTok to get information more than they're potentially more than they're using Google. And also young people really want news coming into their information environment. They don't search for it. That's why news outlets had to go to social media to be in the information environment of young people. And this trend is just going to persist. So I'm wondering if you can touch more on how um, news organizations are dealing with and preparing for this trend that people will use large language models as authoritative sources. Mm -hmm. And whether one regulatory solution is that, say, outputs of coming from large language models need to provide the links that had slightly higher predominance in the outputs for the content. Of course, not the tone, because that would be a very large amount of, of data, but where the actual kind of percentage or, or, or piece of con uh, it, credible information, quote unquote, came from. Thank you. Vina, you've just launched a generative AI product, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I guess to your point, um, this isn't going to go away, and it's about how large language models and AI can in increase transparency and bring more accountability to their outputs. Um, one of our partners is Microsoft, and on, on Bing Chat, when, you, when it returns the kind of answer, it actually marks that answer up and annotates it with the links of the news sources that it consulted and surfaces NewsGuard's score. And that's just one example of being able to show the reader, here's what I've produced in response to your question. You can see exactly where I've sourced each point I've made in my answer. And based on that, you can then decide, is that something I'm going to cite or say or post or repeat? Um, so I think there are ways that transparent tools can be leveraged by this technology to make it more accountable and trustworthy and avoid um, the kind of opacity that comes with um, returning an answer that literally just says, oh, I, I made this up. You know, m my partner works in finance and, you know, he was toying around with something and uh, was researching value comps and the, the numbers surfaced just didn't exist anywhere else online when he found them. And when he asked where that information came from, um, the chatbot just said, oh, I made this up, I'm sorry. Um, so to avoid instances of, of that happening and actually create a bit of an accountability mechanism, you know, there are tools and data available to do so. I mean, search as it stands now actually sends a lot of audience back to news sites, right? Um, I think the way most of the news organizations are currently responding is to simply say, pay us money, which is kind of a strange way of trying to deal with the fact that maybe more people will just stay on search because the answer fueled by Gen AI is a more compact, succinct answer, and they don't need to actually go to the source. I'll put on my um, Wikimedia hat. For us, it's a real issue at Wikipedia because almost every large machine learning, chat, all these generative AI, have learned using Wikipedia as their kind of learning tool. But if they don't then send people back to Wikipedia, then you are creating an interesting challenge. So our conversations with them are less about pay us money. It's more about like, can you, sure, you are saying according to Wikipedia, but you're not giving any link back. So we are asking them to kind of actually turn that into kind of a clickable link, even though the answer might be through uh, a chat GPT kind of a fully contained answer. Richard? Yeah, yeah I, I asked ChatGPT to write my CV for me and invented a whole career that I hadn't had, but would be a lot better off if I had. So that was kind of a strange experience. Um, uh, for those of us who work in education, of course, it's a, it's a huge worry because students are all, already using you know, uh, chat to, uh, to write their essays and so on as well. well. One of the default responses to a lot of the issues that have come up over these two days has been media literacy. What we need is you know, media literacy can, can help get us through this which of course is true, but it's a very long-term solution and there's frankly not a lot of money or focus going into what that means and a lot of media literacy and civics and so on has been cut. 
So that is the answer. And, you know, in the university I work with, uh, in the journalism school, we're now starting to put a lot of effort into uh, talking to the students and working with them so they understand uh, about uh, uh, language models and, and the risks for them and how to use them responsibly and ethically and how not and so on as well. So, you know, that's clearly got to increase. And um, the kind of thing that Vina was talking about in terms, you know, on the economic front, um, uh, uh, the use of this in search, if it just comes up with a body of text that you don't necessarily trust and doesn't send traffic back to the original sites and the rest of it, it's going to be a huge economic issue as well. So I hope as it develops, the kind of links and so on that you have will, will, will emerge. And it, it seems to me that can only be a good thing if it does. So, so hopefully that will, that will happen. It's not there yet. Yeah. I would add, what, what would stop, what's stopping Meta or any social platform from just dropping an AI-generated news product customized individual users into people's feeds? And where do we go if that happens and when that happens? Mm. Um, uh, okay, time for one last question, I think. We're against the clock here. Um, I just wanted to, to give folks a chance to, to expand on something that was briefly touched upon in the Q&A, but basically, um, you know, journalist integrity depends a lot on having um, diverse journalists, um, and that's, a, you know, neither the U.S. nor the U.K. have, uh, have a good record with this. It's abysmal, in fact. Um, and as you've seen local papers and local news organizations close up, uh, you know, everywhere, um, there is no farm system for sort of people from non-collegiate non backgrounds, for example, um, to enter the, the newsroom. Um, more and more getting jobs in journalism depends on unpaid internships that are basically exclusive to people um, who, you know, are, can, are already affording college somehow, um, who may have financial support to go live in an expensive city somewhere. Um, to, and people who do go to college uh, from uh, marginalized backgrounds are often starting out at two-year institutions that don't have campus media. Basically, there's no feeder system. There's no way for these people to, to get in that's, that, like, in, in the, uh, and, and it's, uh, and so, uh, or I, well, I won't say no, but, I've, like, but I'm saying it's, it's, it's much more structurally difficult. Um, and so I was, I just wanted folks, to, I, I would love if the panel could expand a little bit on, um, on that aspect of journalistic integrity and, and sort of where it goes from here. Who would like to expand, but briefly, we have yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with, with everything that you, that you say, and I think it is a big issue, and um, uh, a lot of the problems that journalism uh, faces is because it hasn't been sufficiently diverse and it hasn't been representative enough of all the communities it serves, and that has in turn has led to a lack of trust and to indifference and so on as well. Um, I, uh, I think newsrooms are aware of it. They are working on it. There are all sorts of different kinds of diversity, of course. It's not just, you know, ethnic or gender or economic. There are many different kinds of diversity it has to try and deal with. One thing we are seeing more is an apprenticeship model, a school leaver model, rather than saying everyone has to be a graduate to enter into a newsroom. It's rather kind of going back 50, 60 years, if you like. Uh, that is starting to emerge more certainly here in the UK. And and I hope more widely. Because you're right, you put your finger on a very big issue and um, journalism and newsrooms don't have a great track record on it. I'll, I'll end on my optimistic note again. Um, if you think of the media industry in a barbell where the big brands are doing okay, the middle is like really dead, but the kind of the hyper-local end of it, I'm actually seeing a lot of like people of color owned and managed kind of news organizations I would recommend checking out a network of sites called URL Media in the US. And this is where the philanthropy is actually helping. A lot of hyperlocal sites are being funded um, by the Ford Foundations and others. And a lot of them are serving local communities of color. So I'm seeing a lot of actual good diversity there, and that gives me hope. Tina, do you want a final comment to wrap us up? I'll just flag up one social enterprise based in the UK called PressPad. Um, what they do is essentially provide uh, spare, if journalists or those working in the media industry later in their careers have a spare room in London, they can kind of rent that out at a subsidized rate to journalists who need to come into the city for those internships who then receive not only subsidized housing, but also mentorship. And that's, to me, an excellent example of, you know, more seasoned journalists paying it forward and making the industry a more sustainable place. Thank you. Well, everybody, please join me in thanking Rajuvina and Richard. Thank you.